Welcome back to our 86th episode of the Launcher Farm Show. Where I interview Dale Archdeacon, who's the founder of Smart Coaching and Training. In this episode, Dale and I talk about why agents must shift their scripts from old and out-of-date practices to a more modern approach that really works in today's world. Dale also shares how his sales skills came from learning to personally develop as a person first, then his sales skills followed as a result. We also talk about what types of conversations you should be having in your farm to generate more referrals and build stronger relationships that blow the competition out of the water. Dale also shares a super easy way to leverage content creation into your sales process to multiply your returns drastically. And we talk about how to leverage events and organizations in your community to build your network extremely fast. Plus, we talk about a ton of other ideas that you can use to grow your geographic farm. So be sure to check out this episode, like and subscribe, and enjoy the episode with Dale. Welcome back to another episode of the Launcher Farm Show. I'm your host, Ryan Smith. And today we've got a great guest. It's Dale Archdeacon. He's the founder of Smart Coaching and Training. So Dale, take a second, tell us a bit about yourself and why you're here. Thank you so much, Ryan. Listen, I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, you know, you have a great show. And uh, again, I just I really appreciate being able to come and talk to your audience. Uh, so we are a scripting and dialogue training company for residential real estate sales, as well as sales management consulting. So that's what our specialty is in the real estate space. And you've got a really unique unique part of the business because a lot of people need help with the scripts, need help with the sales and, and don't know what to do or don't know how to do it. And I think the approach you've taken it is really unique and you bring real fresh approach to, to the business as well, instead of just the same old boring scripts that everyone's been using for 50 years. I know you, you really refresh it and repackage it in the ways that agents can apply it to modern approaches. And that's kind of some of the things I want to talk about today is how agents can be really reframing their dialogue and the sales practices they're using in their farm and in their sales process as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. So we are a much more modern methodology for having sales conversations with consumers. Um, I was more traditionally trained, we'll put it that way, right? <laughs> yeah. Where it was more of an adversarial approach. Uh, you would make people wrong. You would outsmart them. You yeah. would, um, you know, try and uh, push them into something that might not actually have been in their best interest. And so that is just not the way that humans interact anymore. We're all much more sophisticated. And, and so by extension, our sales conversations and our interactions with consumers need to be much more sophisticated. And so we can have really great sales interactions, right, with consumers where it's a mutually created situation uh, or process that everybody can actually enjoy. And, you know, back when I was initially selling early on in my career where it was more adversarial where it was you know more of a win-lose situation um nobody liked it i didn't yeah. like it the yeah. consumers didn't like it um and so now it feels much more comfortable and and it's it's a joy to be able to bring this kind of training to salespeople and level them up because they become more comfortable confident and um you know they enjoy the process of working with potential clients that's, that's a that's a huge part of it. And I think for a lot of agents, when they can get comfortable with what they're doing, they'll enjoy it more. Like you said, be willing to do it more, be willing to to step out of their comfort zone a little bit more. And if they know they hate it, they hate doing that, or if they've tried old school scripting and, and sales, they've tried it once and go, I'm never going to do that again. With that new approach, it really reshapes things. So I want to go back to then that beginning part of it, because you talked about the old school training versus that new. How did that evolution happen? And how did you go from that old school practices to really evolving? You know, the funny thing is that I had to personally develop as a, as a person, right? Mm -hmm. So it really came as a personal development uh, process for me because I went from being a salesperson to having to lead and train and manage other people. Yeah. And you can't be the I in team, right? And, <laughs> yeah. and be able to lead other people. And you can't be... Uh, and more importantly, it was when I got into a middle, middle management position mm. where I couldn't be the owner and whatever I, my way or the highway, right? Yeah. However, I was in a middle management position where I needed to have a team achieve and I needed to have, I needed to be able to obtain results through others, but I didn't have the latitude to simply say, do it my way or get out, right? Yeah. 
And I had to learn how to work with and communicate with people who I didn't agree with and didn't want to work with or communicate (laughs) with. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so initially I started out on that personal development journey of saying, all right, this person, I don't like them and they aren't doing what I want. And uh, I can't fire them. I have (laughs) to work with them. How can I manipulate them? Right. (laughs) That's where I started. I was like, all right, let me get better at manipulation. Yeah. And through the process of, first trying to figure out how to better manipulate, I had to discover more about what was going on inside of me, which, which made me want to manipulate in the first place, as well as learning how people can be manipulated and what those factors are and how to best, best manipulate them, if that makes sense. So if once I understood that people were able to be manipulated, the more that they felt They were being heard and listened to and valued. I then went on to discover that, wow, it's not, it it doesn't have to be manipulation. You can be sincere about hearing them and valuing them and understanding their perspective. That's when our methodology for sales really developed uh, and went beyond manipulation to genuine, um, empathy and genuine partnership yeah. and so we've just really kind of developed our language our scripting our dialogue our approach our perspective from much more of an empathy based uh, you know understanding yep. uh, and so that's kind of the crazy story about how a high, <laughs> a high d a type personality grew <laughs> to be a much nicer human being I guess. <laughs> yeah. no better way to put that and it's good that you said about the manipulation because a lot of people see sales as manipulation. And again, a lot of the old school tr- traditional training is like just strong arm them, tweak them, try this thing until they do what you want. And the reality is it's it's somewhere in between. You you have to learn to control the conversation. You have to learn to to understand sales. You have to learn psychology, but it doesn't have to be breaking someone's back to get what you want. It doesn't have to be tricking people. And a lot, again, a lot of the old school training is, I wouldn't say, nefarious but there's some sneaky tactics and strategies and it's somewhere in between where i find a lot of agents are in one camp or the other where it's like it's all scripting and it's all that or or i don't want to do any scripting i don't want to do anything and i think you kind of have to find somewhere in the middle where it's being genuine having those genuine conversations like you mentioned and having empathy and listening and it's more of understanding people and not understanding sales would would that be correct to say that yeah approach Absolutely. And I will say this for any of my type A driver personalities out there who think that I just like am being too flowery, that's not the case, right? (laughs) Because even within within our training and within my, you know, perspective on sales is, uh, you know, this is part of something that we, I'm going to turn my ringer off so you can interrupt us. Part of uh, the training when, especially when working with really nice salespeople, right? The ones who don't want to confront anyone, the ones who don't want to push leads out of their comfort zone. Part of what we need to do is we need to teach them, hey, we we help shift their perspective. We say, Mm -hmm. listen, I want you to pretend that you are an ER nurse, right? You're an ER nurse. This lead has just stumbled in with a gunshot wound, right? They want immediate treatment, but you have to get a series of questions answered. Otherwise, you can kill them, right? Mm -hmm. Does that person want to answer your damn questions right now? (laughs) No, they don't want to answer your questions. But in order for you to serve them at the highest level, you have to push them out of their comfort zone. Yeah. And so some of that demonstration for people helps to shift their mindset, right? To to enable them and empower them, especially the nicer ones, to be willing to push a stranger out of their comfort zone for their own best interest. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to, to put it that way and to, to understand that, that it's it's for their best interest, not self-serving. And again, if you're just doing self-serving based questions, it's going to feel that way. And it's going to feel like you don't want to do it when you know that you're doing it for the right reason and you're doing it for their best interest. It makes it a lot easier to, to, to do that. So what kind of changes have you seen with agents who have gone from not scripting or, or not doing scripting well or sales management well to really having that change what kind of things have you seen oh man i mean it just explodes their confidence first of all they go from like i said an adversarial uh interaction to one Mm. that they actually enjoy they're like wow 
give me any stranger to basically co-create a potential piece of business, right? Yeah. And if there isn't business there, if if there if it isn't in the lead, I'm going to use lead. If it isn't in the lead's best interest to execute now or to execute with this company or to execute in this way, great. We'll, we both discover that together. And either way, man, like we're going to, you know, skip off into the sunset hand in hand and do great business together, or we're going to part ways. But either way, I'm totally happy. It doesn't really matter, right? And because of that approach, because of that confidence, and let me just bring it down to even more uh, clear rather than so theoretical, right? Yep. When they know what to say and what to ask in any given situation, they feel so much more comfortable and confident. And they're actually interested in having these conversations and interested in having these interactions more than trying to avoid it. Yep. So a lot of what a lot of people, they as a salesperson, a lot of, and myself included, all of us, we want the sale, but we don't want the struggle, right? Yeah. And so to the point where we can turn struggle, where we can change it from struggle into, you know, a comfortable, easy, repeatable process, that's what really encourages people to move on and, and, and obtain that confidence. And I think it also keeps people sticking with it too, because if they get the confrontation, they get that and they aren't comfortable, then it's easy to jump ship when, when they're trying to do any type of lead generation or trying to follow up with their database or whatever. And it, it becomes daunting and scary before they even started and they either give up or, or don't stick with it, which yes. that alone, like that, that will make you the money just sticking with it. Yeah, absolutely. It's good that you mentioned database or even farm, right? Because I know that's your specialty. You know, how many times can you knock on somebody's door and ask them if they want to sell their house? Yeah. How many times can you call somebody that you worked with in the past and ask them if they have someone to refer to you? So, you know, that's that's why a lot of people don't do it. Uh, they avoid it. And so, you know, part of what we also do is really you need to be much more creative about that and shift your perspective about what you're doing. Yep. Old Dale would call you up every so often, you know, uh, frequently and, and ask you for business, I felt, I personally felt uncomfortable about it, right? Because I yeah. knew that wasn't a comfortable conversation. Um, so you just have to be more creative about it. In terms I want, of yeah, I want to dive into the, how you do that and follow up and add that value. But before we do that, I want to ask you about leads because you, you hesitated on saying about the lead because I know each person has a different definition of what a lead is and what it isn't. How would you describe to agents how you use a, a, gen, a lead category and how can they help kind of dissect what would classify or, or qualify as a leader or not, or how can you sure. tell the difference? Sure. And you know, the reason I hesitated is because among coaching and training in our industry, in the real estate industry, especially, you know, there's like this pushback, like, Oh, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a consultant. Uh, <laughs> they aren't leads. They're people. Yeah. yeah whatever. <laughs> Fine. Yes. They're all people. And I'm saying we need to have a great, you know, mutual, mutually beneficial conversation with them, but let's just call a spade a spade. I'm a salesperson. You are a salesperson. That's what you do for a living. And that's how the general public regards you, no matter what you call yourself. Yeah. And a potential piece of business is known as a lead. <laughs> that's what it's yeah. called. Um, so that's why I hesitated there. But um, your, can you refresh your question for me again? Because I went off topic a little bit. Yeah. So agents sometimes struggle knowing what a lead is, what it isn't leading, mm. and how, what, how do you yeah. actually say, this is what a, someone I'm going to follow up with, or how do I classify those initial contacts? Got it. Okay. So uh, lead, I would say, is someone who has in some way um, demonstrated that they are within the, that they're in the buying cycle, right? That they're somewhere in the buying funnel, buying, meaning buying our services, which would mean right. in this case, either selling or purchasing real estate, uh, or renting it out. Right. So that would be a lead. Somebody who said, I have the intent to do that. Yep. Um, so that's basically all that I would call a lead. Okay. And then how do you then further break it down into saying, how am I going to find out who am I going to, or sorry, who am I going to follow up with on, on what level? Because I had a lot of agents I struggle with in my experience. They consider someone who's not serious, not motivated, a lead, and then someone who's hot to trot, and they kind of put them into the same category at times. So how do you, or do you kind of segment your, your, your sure. database? Yeah, absolutely. And um, so we look at it more as a database, right? So okay. within my database, <clears throat> that we're consistently communicating with, being in front of, showing evidence of success to, 
supporting, giving value to, et cetera, et cetera. For inside that database, you end up with people who raise their hands, right? Yep. And so if you raise your hand, you're a new lead. Uh, once we've had a conversation or an interaction and we do some qualification with you, you then fall into a few other buckets, right? Which would be a hot lead or somebody who's going to execute in a very short period of time. Yep. If we're talking specifically about real estate, that would be say this month, within 30 days, you're going to execute would be yep. hot, right? The next stage would be somewhere between a month to three months and then three months to six months and then nine months plus, right? Yep. Uh, or you just end up sort of running back off into the general database of people who are not active in the sales funnel. However, are still consuming our material, are still, you know, it is what we are cultivating. So yeah. does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's good. And that's, you mentioned about the, the people that are consuming your content. And I think that's an important aspect too, because a lot of agents miss that part. And if they're looking for just that hot leads and they're always just searching for hot leads. And I've always said, I'd rather have five years to build a relationship with someone than five weeks, because it's just a, some new brand new hot lead that you just met. If you can have someone that's in your pipeline that you're adding value to, staying in touch with, creating conversations and creating relationship with in, in three years, five years time from now, they're going to be, you're going to be the only person they're going to want to work with because they oh, built a relationship. And that's to me more valuable than just that, that 30 day lead. Oh yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, when you and I spoke before this interview, um, <clears throat> it, I was just speaking at, a, at an event in Kentucky and there were several people, several speakers who were focused on video, right? Hey, you should be doing video. You need to be doing these kind of videos. You need to be sending it out, you know? And the funny thing is they kept preaching to, to the room that they should be using video. And it seems like for some reason, agents underproduce content. I'm not mm -hmm. sure why they do that. You know, listen, I'm a procrastinator too. And I didn't start, you know consistently producing content until I had a team to help me do it. Mm. However, now that, you know, in our coaching and our sales training business, you know, what I try to reinforce with real estate agents is that probably 75% of the time when a prospect, when a lead reaches out to my company and says, Hey, I'm interested in training for myself, or I'm interested in having you train my team or my brokerage. Yep. Uh, probably 75% of the time when I have a sales conversation with them, when we jump on zoom and we talk about it, they're already pre-sold. Yeah. I hear things like I've been watching, I've been listening to your podcast. Cash call is one of our podcasts. Yep. I've been watching your videos. I've been consuming your material. My team already uses like we screen your videos in our training sessions. Right. Yeah. And so when I have that conversation, it's so much easier. Right. Yeah. I don't need to prove who we are. We don't need to prove who we are. We don't need to prove our material. And, and in a lot of cases, it's already made an impact in their businesses. Yeah. At that point, it's pretty much just, hey, how much do you charge? Yeah. And when can we start, right? Yeah. And so what I'm saying is that for your audience, if you want much more conversations about, hey, I love you. You sell houses in this area. You do a great job. You don't know who I am, but I want you to come to my house and tell me how much commission you want in order to get it sold to. If you want more of those conversations, it comes down to the content and the size of the audience that you're putting that content in front of consistently. Perfect. So that's exactly what I want to dive into and discuss some of those strategies. Because again, I find a lot of agents struggle with creating a plan around that, creating consistency, like you said, and creating value that actually resonates. So if people are thinking about creating that plan, rather than just worrying about the, the direct, just day-to-day -day sales calls, how would an agent go about creating a plan that's going to engage people over the next year, two years? Sure. Well, I can tell you this, this is my theory on why Zillow, for instance, hasn't been able to get rid of us yet. And it is because real estate, first of all, we are all used car lots. Okay. Mm -hmm residential resales are selling it's it's like selling a used car yep. i have a used car you have a used car right and we have to figure out how we're going to sell that used car and us real estate agents are all used car sales people right yep. and i'm not going to drive a car from pa to california right in order to sell it i'm going to sell it locally yep and i want to know what it's worth locally right yep. and and it's going to compete with the other cars that are available locally Yep. And so 
the point about that is that we are all interested. I like to use cars as the analogy to change it from houses. So if I live in your neighborhood, Ryan, you and I are going to talk consistently about how much the cars are worth. And did you see who sold this over here and how much they got it? Oh my God, this is, did you see the hoarder house? Well, somebody something <laughs> should be done about that, right? Yeah. And so the more hyper, hyper local that you can get, you just make yourself the de facto expert on, yep. on your farm's goings on and prices and happenings and developments and impact, right? Yep. And you just start talking about that and you talk about that and you make yourself the mayor of your local real estate um, biome, right? That's yep. what you do. Yep. You take it, you own it. And the longer you show up and act like you own it, the more people are going to believe that you own it. 100%. And that's one of the things I, I preach all the time. It's something I created called the CPR, which is community or community positioning and relationships. And the key is the positioning part. Well, the all key part of it, but like you're talking about is the positioning part is you position yourself as the expert and the ambassador. You show that you know the area. It doesn't have to, you don't even have to even sold a home in the area, but if you know more information, better information than the other agents, you're going to be seen as that expert. And if you then look after those, the people in your community, you put them first, you put them ahead of the transaction, you put the community ahead of your needs, you then become at the ambassador for that community. And when you do that, that builds those relationships, that builds the conversations, that builds the trust versus traditional farming, which is just sending a bunch of postcards telling people how great you are, or I've sold this many homes and that can work, but it doesn't work at all like it used to. And it's very expensive. It's very time consuming or, or, or costly and you don't get the results and it takes a lot of time to get the results. So building relationships, like you just said, is the key to really creating a solid farm. And that's where you're going to get the, the biggest results. Absolutely. And let's, again, re, um, compare it to my sales training company. So it, it, I like to use that, again, to take it out of the context of real estate to try and shift the perspective. Yep. So the way, one of the ways in which I've grown our training company is by one being interviewed by podcasters like yourself early yep. on. That's how I got my start. Uh, because you bring with it a, you, you give me and my company instant credibility with yep. your listeners. So how is that relevant to your listeners now in your local community, you find the influencers that they already like and you yep. friend them and you start talking to them. Yeah, that's one. That's the relevance there. Right. Two, in my company, we've created strategic partnerships with organizations that have large crowds of people. Right. Yep. Uh, I we partner with I don't know. Are we allowed to say any vendor names? Yep. Here? Yeah. yeah. Yep. OK, so we partner with follow up boss. We are now integrated into follow-up boss for anybody who doesn't know what follow-up boss is it's an amazing crm that plugs into and plays with any websites and any lead generation um what's it called uh, avenues whatever right? yeah. any lead generation platforms uh we are now integrated into follow-up boss and your listeners can actually get some of our training if they are wow. follow -up boss clients what how is that relevant Follow-up boss has introduced us into a giant audience that yep. I could not have purchased. I don't even know how much it would cost me to have purchased that audience, but I, I don't want to know. <laughs> I didn't have to, yeah, right? Yeah. So likewise, you know, you don't have to spend marketing dollars to get print advertising into every single house yep. in your community. What you want to do is you want to find the people in your community, the organizations in your community, the, um, the events, the whatever in your community that are already tapping into a big audience, yeah. right? So for instance, uh, my son plays in Little League. He actually just finished, right? So he had his last season. He's done with Little League. But Little League is pretty big in my area. And there's a lot of families and a lot of people involved in Little League. Yeah. So you just go and you get next to the commissioners, you get next to the people who run or organize the, um, the what's it called, when you generate money. Uh, like the fundraiser type stuff? A fundraiser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoever handles the fundraiser, mm. you get in tight with them yeah. and they will put you in front of the audience. So yeah. that's a, a similar relevant thing for your listeners. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things I talk about all the time is that using the one-to-many approach versus trying to sell yourself one-to-one. -one, and that's where a lot of 
old school marketing or a lot of old school skills is just trying to sell us to that one person at a time. If you can get in front of local businesses who have an audience, if you can get in front of influencers, if you can get in front of community events, you can tap into a much broader audience for a lot cheaper, for a lot easier. And the more you do that in the more different ways people see you, they saw you at the event, they saw you at the business thing, they saw you at online, they saw, that's when you start bringing it together. And that's, that's really where you create the magic. If you're just trying to sound a postcard, <coughs> it's tossed in the mail, that's not enough. So right. using that, that one to many is a, is a huge opportunity. Absolutely. And so for, for listeners, I, I know that personally, I, you know, I started from the mindset of one-to-one, -one, right? I was like, oh, how am I going to get one-to-one -one with these people? How am I going to personally sell myself to each individual one person who could possibly buy our services? Yep. That's exhausting and expensive. <laughs> exactly. right? It's hard. It takes yeah. a really long time to do that. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of lazy, uh, to be honest with you. And like, I want, <laughs> I want to be more efficient. I think, I think us lazy people use the word efficient. I want to be yes, more efficient. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I'll give you another example. My wife, uh, is, is a real estate salesperson in our area. She does really well. Um, my son is a skateboarder. My wife and son have for the past year been work, put together an organization to work on getting a skate park in our local nice. town. Right. And as a result of her working on putting a skate park in our local town, she is now connected with business owners and local uh, leadership like she never would have been before. Yep. Uh, which, ha it, you know, gives her that entry to a much bigger audience. But for the listeners, don't get intimidated by that. You don't have to come up with a skate park, <laughs> yeah. you, right? Yeah. In order to get connected. But listen, if my wife were not a real estate agent and you were, you go to her and you say, oh, hey, can I help with the skate park? Yes, exactly. I'll go talk to local businesses for you. What do you need, right? Exactly. Who do you need to be connected to? It's a very easy, when you support others' uh, endeavors or their, whatever their project is, by extension, you have an excuse to go and talk to people who have big audiences, right? Exactly. And then you slide the real estate in there. Exactly. And that's one of the things I do talk about when people are using direct mail is to tie it to other events and tie it to things that you're part of instead of just mail. If you're going to mail out a postcard, don't just have it be, I just listed a home or I'm the best have it. I listed a home and I'm also supporting this event or there's something coming up in the community or we're trying to raise awareness for this because then it double dips and it helps connect you to the community rather than just being real estate related. Yeah. You can then tie that together, which is huge. You need, so, to, be set, you need to set yourself apart. Exactly. So I want to dive into then the individual side of following up because I know when we talked prior to recording, we we're talking about agents sometimes struggle with because they just follow up and say, hey, are you thinking about making a move? Hey, you think about making a move? And they kind of they choke on that or they don't know what to say. How can agents create more value in those follow-up calls? How can they create a better environment that they're going to do better with and the people are going to resonate with? Yeah, I think that what's, so we work with a lot of teams and brokerages across North America. And what I find consistently is that the most successful teams, the most successful brokerages basically will create a calendar of local events. Yeah. And that gives them an excuse or a reason beyond, are you ready to sell or buy yet to mm. reach out to their, their community, to reach out individually to people. Yep. And so what you do is you put together a schedule of events or, uh, um, or uh, sponsorships or whatever it may be. And then you put together a schedule of outreach, right? Yeah. So we're going, you know, around something that we're going to do, there's the initial outreach to invite you. There's a reminder that you were invited to find out if you're going to do it or participate or whatever. Then there's an update on what happened, what the results were, yeah. um, or actually even during, right? There can be sort of a this is what's going on or a, a present tense update. Yep. And then there can be a post follow-up, uh, which then bleeds into the next round of, Hey, we're doing this, or this is going on. Um, and it's, you know, totally based on seasons or whatever it yep. is. So that's what they do. They just come up with things, right? We're going to have, we're going to sponsor a dumpster for people to do a clean out, right? For spring cleaning, we're going to sponsor an ice cream truck to come around. We're going to, we've come, you know, we've gotten together uh, with the three local breweries to do a, a pop-up beer tent and outdoor game uh, event. Uh, we're running a coat drive. We're doing a bicycle uh, donation uh, drive, you know, any number of things. You just make the stuff up and you do it. Yeah. 
And I think what you said earlier too, is if you don't have the time or energy to do it, tack on to, or, or jump onto other people doing these things as well. There are people doing events in the community. If there's not doing things in the community, that's an opportunity for you because then oh, there yeah. isn't events going on. And if there are events going on in your community, then, then tag along and be part of that. And you don't have to recreate the wheel. You can be part of that. You can add value to them. You can create that. And that's, that's something we did in, in our farm. And we put together an event and when we, uh, we pr propose to them rather than saying just sponsorship, we said rather than sponsor, we'll pay for postcard marketing in the area and we'll pay it and we'll mail it to everyone. I explained how much it normally costs us. And we did one side, the event, one side was our real estate uh, postcard. And then we door knocked the area and it was very easy to go in there and say, Hey, you know, we're hosting an event on May 1st. It's an awesome event. We're just coming up. And then at the end of it was, Oh, by the way, have you guys considered making a move? So it was easier to get my foot in the door to, to create that relationship up front and then tack on real estate. If I would have came to the door saying, Hey, you think we're making a move, slam the door in my face and then you move on. So tying into other events and, and adding on can, can really change how you do it and change how you're seen in the community as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, m modern salespeople are more, this is something that we teach and people are more realizing it now is you don't have to always directly ask if they yep. want to purchase your service because <clears throat> just making sure that they know what you do and uh, that you're successful at it yeah. usually your hand rate, the, the people who are within that, that funnel, that buying cycle will ask you. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. And I've interviewed lots of people on my show and it's amazing how many of them I've asked that. And they say, we don't really ask for business. We don't really go out there and tell, like we're, we're involved. We're part of the community. They know who we are. They know what we do because of the volume of what they're doing because of the, just being an active and engaged people know. And, and if they're doing one-on-one -on -one, people will ask, what are you doing? And if you're promoting and doing things in the events, because they know because of your brand, because of the marketing you're doing, people will know. And when they are ready, they'll want to work with you. And like you said, half the, or 75% of the sales is already done at that point. And it's a lot easier to, to build those relationships that way. Yes. I started out as a hardcore cold call prospector calling expireds, calling for sale by owners, door knocking, doing circle prospecting. And I'm not denigrating that stuff. It still works. Yep. It's, it's tried and true. It still works. It's not the easiest thing to do, which is why a lot of people avoid it. Yep. Um, but it does work. But I can tell you this, it is way easier when people already feel they know, like, and trust you and yeah want to do business with you and you just have to not screw it up right that is <laughs> exactly. way exactly. easier and much exactly. more fun yeah and the other thing i find with farming is if you do those strategies in your farm it makes it easier like when we i one of my biggest things was for sale by owners when i first got in the business i did really well with for sale by owners and then i kind of put it on the side i started farming and then i did for sale by owners in my farm after doing all the other stuff and it was so much easier because They've been getting the things you've been sending. They saw the things you're involved in. They've been following your, your newsletter and things like that. So it becomes easier to layer in those strategies that may not have been as fun or as exciting or maybe mind numbing to do when you layer it into your farm with the other things you're doing. It becomes so much easier, more effective, and you get better results overall. Oh yeah, absolutely. So as a fellow former cold fizz bower, you know what I mean? Yeah. It is, you, you, we both know the pain and the difficulty of randomly calling up a complete <laughs> and utter stranger who is already opposed to you yeah. and they have no idea who you are and you're just another number who's bothering them trying to <laughs> exactly. do something in a different way right yep. um and so yeah if a fizzbo could be like oh wow yeah i know your name i know your face i know you have success my concern is x right yeah great all right now we're on a really good footing here i just yeah. have to solve for x and and we can do business yeah. And it's, it, it comes down to doing it, doing it well, doing it consistently, and then you'll get the results, but you have to be willing to do it. So I want to dive into then the sales side of things behind the scenes. I want to talk about some best practices when it comes to farming and sales, because again, I think you have an advantage when you do farming correctly, but you still have to tweak things a bit. So where, what have you seen agents do well when it comes to the, the sales process behind the scenes when it comes to farming? So you need to have some sort of, I, I recommend having some kind of USP and I recommend having some sort of sales process, right? Mm. Which is where you, and it's not complicated, right? Like, a, yeah. do you want to know what your house is worth or, you know, properties have gone up by X percentage. Do you want to know what that means for you or the five key steps to make sure that you get 
uh, the best deal from your next real estate agent, right? Uh, you, you create some sort of offer, some sort of mini funnel, if you will. And when I yep. say funnel for the listeners, all I'm saying is, hey, there's this piece of value I'm going to offer to you that is relevant yep. to someone who is entering the sales funnel, right? Uh, and I'm going to offer that out. And then generally the people who accept that or take me up on that offer are signaling that they may be within that sales funnel. Yeah. That's where the conversation starts. Once you now have that interaction with someone, now we can do discovery. We can figure out where you're at on that trajectory or that timeline. Are you actually a lead or are you not? Um, and then we figure out what we're going to do with you. So does that answer yeah. the question yeah. you're looking for? Yeah. And I think too, it also adds in, I would add in that, it's good to layer in those USPs because a lot of times agents will have like one thing. They come up with like, oh, we're going to do a home evaluation and that's the only offer they make. And I always tell agents, you should be doing that plus, 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 plus because certain people are going to respond to certain things. There's going to be certain things that captures people's attention and you may not have, you may have got the wife and the husband would have responded or that wasn't hot enough of a, an offer for them the next one. And by doing a number of them throughout the year, you're going to layer in more opportunities and offers. Now, there's a point of diminishing returns where, like you said, if they're not going to sell, they're not going to sell, they're right. not going to move. You can keep sending them stuff. And if they're not going to make a move, it's finding the people who are and as fast as you can, and as quickly as you can to, to make sure you build that funnel in place. Yeah, exactly. And if we talk about offers, <coughs> the more, um, the, if you make it a little bit more specific, if you think about the, if you think about the difficulties or the questions that go on in the prospect's mind, right? So if I'm looking to potentially sell my home, uh, there could be, hmm, how much is it going to cost me to sell my home? There could mm. be, what's my home worth? That's a pretty obvious trope, right? That's done consistently. Yep. There could be, oh man, I don't know if I can sell my house. Do I have to leave before I buy another house, right? Yep. There could be, uh, how do I buy my next house when I need the money from this house in order to get moved? And so I'm just naming all of these issues that go on yeah. with people that you can then turn into that piece of value that uh what are they, a lead magnet is what it's referred yeah. to right yeah. so that's that's how you craft those things and you start with one and you just keep adding them exactly because if you don't catch me with what's my home worth because it's generic you might catch me with hmm uh the best way to be able to you know ensure that i find my next property before i have to leave my home you know, yeah. so some kind of thing like that, if once you start uh, getting more specific and nailing those questions in their mind, yeah. one of them is going to resonate, one's going to pop for you. Yeah, exactly. And then it's testing it and trying it and testing new things and tweaking it. And that's, that's the part that I love. It's the, I always treat it like a laboratory and it's like doing little experiments and seeing what works, what doesn't work. And a lot of times agents will do something, oh, it doesn't work. And then they'll go, oh, that didn't work. It's like, no, try it, test it tweak it. And that's why I always tell agents as well is to start smaller in your farm and don't go to a 5,000 home farm, go to 500 homes, kind of figure out some of those offers. Then you can scale up to the 5,000 home farm where you know this offer works well, this follow-up works well, this system works well, this event works well, then it's easier to scale up than it is. And I always say it's better to scale up than it is to scale back because scaling back sucks in farming and it, it's a lot of money wasted. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So so I want to ask you then about the other follow-up offers, because you mentioned doing events and, and things in the community. What other things are you finding working well to stay in contact with people who may not be like, I, I, you get people who say, ah, we might sell in the next year or two. What kind of things are you doing or are you seeing agents do that keeps, keeps the relationship going, may not be as pushy or may not be as salesy without hounding them, and, and, but still adding value to them? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think you just have to vary your methods. So you should be you should be doing live stuff. You should start with the cheap stuff and move up to the more expensive stuff and just be layering it in there. So some of the most expensive stuff would be direct mail. Yep. Right? So if you let's say if you were going to employ a direct mail strategy, let's say that you only do four pieces in a year, right? But make it relevant to the seasons or whatever it may be. Yep. Plus, you're going to do some personal direct outreach. Plus. You're going to be running some geo-targeted ads within a particular area that, uh, you know, you're, you're just layering these items on top of each other. 
plus then supporting or sponsoring a couple of events in the local community and even creating a few of your own in certain areas. So it's really about the mix yeah. that you put together that will help with the cost savings exactly. rather than trying to do uh, you know, a, a piece every month to a very large, uh, you know, a mailing piece uh, to a very large farm every single month. Yeah. So I think that you can get by in a much more cost-effective way and be able to hit people in multiple channels. Exactly. And that's, that's, I fully believe that it's something I teach. I talk about strategy stacking and using those different strategies to tie together, to create more balance in your business and create more opportunities that doesn't have to cost you an arm and a leg. And that's one of the biggest objections I get people when they think about farming, they go, I don't have the money. I don't have the, I can't send postcards every month or I can't send flyers every month. And I say, that's, that's a small piece of it. If you decide to do that, there's so many other things you can be doing like the one to many approaches, doing video, doing events, things like that, that doesn't have to cost you anything other than, than your time to get it started. It's just, you got to stitch it together and figure out what works and what's going to work for you. Yeah. I think that if, if I were to get back into it now, my highest priority would be one, either create a local event that I would sponsor and find other people to join in, or I would go and find one that's current. I'd probably start with one that's currently going yep. on. Uh, and tie myself to that, volunteer there, and then work through that roster of people connected to it to find the people who have the biggest audiences yeah, exactly. and get next to them. I would let it's leverage, right? I'd yeah. start there. That costs you nothing but your time. Yeah, exactly. And you got to get uncomfortable at times, but that is going to be where you're going to get the most connections, like you said, and, and build the most relationships. And I'd rather connect with one person who can connect me to 10 people than try to connect with 10 people individually, because it's going to be a lot harder to make those connections. And you mentioned earlier too, is that you being introduced by being on other people's shows, by being on other people's things, you built, you get the credibility built in. So by being part of an organization that's already doing something, by being connected to those local businesses, by being connected to the movers and shakers, you're gaining extra credibility and not having to, to start from scratch. And it just makes it that much easier to, to build relationships. Yeah. Let me give another example, man, just to repeat, kind of repeat that. I didn't start my own podcast until just a couple of years ago. And I've mm. been doing this for a long time. I started out by going to other people's podcasts, getting yeah. on their shows, right? I was like, I realized pretty quickly that I can either be the the nut on a soapbox with my own megaphone that most <laughs> yeah. people didn't want to listen to <laughs> yeah. or i could go to where the crowds were and there was already and borrow their megaphone right yeah. have them hand it to me and said say this guy knows what he's doing please listen to him you crowd of attendees yeah. um and so if that helps your audience i hope that it does it's way way faster yeah. to hit your wagon to to find the crowd and get the invitation to take the microphone exactly. versus getting your own microphone and starting with an audience of one. Exactly. It's the Oprah effect. You get on Oprah and, and you be a guest on Oprah, you, you mm. instantly get like, that can be completely change your business. And if you can find those people in the community who can open you up to that, that's a huge opportunity. I totally, I should have gotten on Oprah. Damn yeah. <laughs> I figured out some way yeah. to finagle onto Oprah. Yeah. I don't know how that would have been. So we always wrap up with the last piece of advice. So if you were giving agents some advice on how to really build some sales processes or build some opportunities in their farm, what would you give them? Yeah. Well, we've given a whole bunch of advice. So what I would say is it, uh, my friend, Brian Curtis, who's also my co-host likes to say this. He says, my half-ass plan executed is way better than your perfect plan. Not executed. Yep. Right. So just do it. Uh, at either start with your first thing now and do it in a in an ugly way or add whatever i next idea is that you have layer it in there do it ugly and start measuring the results yeah it's great advice got to do it that's <laughs> you need to just follow the pro start so and we have one uh, best book one book that's you that's made an impact on your life or you think would have an impact on our viewers lives yeah absolutely and so i would say that is the the reason that i'm uh, mentioning this book is that you know as i told your audience the trajectory that i went through i discovered uh, i found my it's called the accidental sales manager and in real estate a lot of us team leaders team uh, managers end up being accidental sales managers. We weren't taught how to do it yep. and we, we get thrust into it. So that book really helped me a lot when I was, you know, managing and training other salespeople and, and building companies. 
Uh, so it's called the Accidental Sales Manager by Chris Little. It's L Y T L E. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes so our viewers can check that out. And how can our viewers check out what you're up to, find out what you're doing, and connect with you? Sure. Uh, we are uh, we're all over the place, all over the internet. Uh, our <laughs> website is smartinsidesales.com. Uh, we do have also have a YouTube channel, and actually on our website you can find how to access our Cash Call podcast. So in Cash Call we actually review recorded conversations of salespeople because we're all about scripting and dialogue and yeah. so we break those things down we talk about best practices and we help people up their game through our podcast that's awesome yeah i've listened to it it's a great show i my girlfriend's actually taking some of your training right now she loves it she's was very hesitant about doing this the scripting and training and she's it says it's amazing and she's got a whole different confidence when she's been making her calls recently so it's been awesome so i can attest to, to, to what you guys are working on i appreciate that testimony Awesome. So thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate you bringing your insight, your wisdom and experience to our audience. And I know if they take your advice, do some things we talked about, they can absolutely have success. So thank you for sharing that with our audience. I know they're going to really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for checking out today's episode. If you'd like more videos like this, be sure to sub like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook page and our other social media channels. Looking forward to bringing you more great content like this and happy farming. <laughs>